first. Welcome to Hey, great shot. This is the Great Shot Podcast, a Crack Rackets and Tennis Channel Podcast Network production. My name is Alex Gruskin. Welcome into another edition of The Deciding Point, our weekly breakdown of all the action happening across the Division I college tennis world. Of course, this week in Division I women's college tennis was a doozy, the national indoor championships on our hands. We want to thank all of you listeners, all of you viewers who tuned in to our coverage of the event. It was such a pleasure for us to have first ball to last coverage of the national championships. And of course, a huge thank you to our friends at the ITA for the opportunity to do that. Of course, we are also thrilled to continue our coverage this weekend into the Division I Men's National Indoor Championships. Once again, you'll be able to catch first ball to last coverage of the event on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel this time. It's going to be myself, Mark Bay, and super producer Daniel Westoff covering all of the action. We hope that you'll tune in. We hope that you all will enjoy. I do have to give another huge thank you to my partner in crime from the past weekend, Mike Cation. It's a lot of time in that broadcast booth. And certainly your relationship is tested. I can happily report he and I had a lovely weekend of action together. It's obviously such a pleasure for us to have the chance to call 16 of the best teams in the nation, all competing in one building. And obviously, if you tuned into any of the action, it all delivered. And of course, on today's show, what we want to do is break down the last two days of the national indoor championships. Of course, we broke down one in two days, one and two, excuse me, already on our mini break podcast feed, but we have yet to talk about the semifinals yet to talk about the championship match. And if we are going to do that here on today's podcast, there's only one man I can turn to, to help join me in breaking it all down. Of course, you know him best as your co-favorite writer, on our website, CrackedRackets.com, founder of the No Ad, No Problem blog, of course, our friend, John J. Parsons. J., welcome back to the show. Hey, great shot. Did you enjoy yourself some national indoors action? I had a great time. You might be swapping out Cation, but you're keeping me in the comments ah. through the weekend. So I'm looking forward to another weekend. Um, overall, I thought it was really well done. So exciting to see. Um, props to you and the team. It was a great weekend. And I thought, you know, I thought you said it best. This is an information gathering weekend and information we did gather. So really excited to break it down with you. There was no more difficult task than coming up with my top 25 poll this week for the USTA. And yeah, I mean, again, all of these teams right now are exceptional. And certainly this weekend, you could tell this was a first time out at this national stage for a bunch of these groups. And you saw those nerves, you saw the deuce points blown or the five, two set leads, all these different comeback things. And yeah, more than anything else, though, the quality was exceptional. And obviously, that is what we want to talk about on today's show. We want to break down our national championship match, talk about the national semifinals, offer our other takeaways from the event. Of course, I had the opportunity to speak with the head uh, championship winning head coach, UNC women's tennis head coach, Brian Calbus, who's going to join us on today's show for a brief interview that you can catch in its entirety tomorrow on the Cracked Interviews podcast feed, of course, We'll also offer our updated Cracked Rackets top 10 talk about the week ahead in women's college tennis as well. With all of that said, a huge shout out to our friends at Swing Vision, the power behind today's show. Of course, they're also powering some of the latest and greatest innovations happening in tennis technology. I'm telling you folks, we are fewer than two years away from being able to have automated line calling at just about every event. And that is a testament to the efforts of of our friends at Swing Vision. If you want to learn more about them, if you would like their help managing your game, believe me, no one does it better. You can learn more about Swing Vision by clicking on the link in the description of this episode. You use our promo code CRACK20, you'll get 20% off a off of your purchase as well as a free 14-day pro trial. Again, a huge shout out to our friends at Swing Vision. With all of that said, Jay, let's break down the past weekend 
of action. And let's start with the national championship match because you already know the headline for the third consecutive season. It's the University of North Carolina capturing the national indoor crown. Now, I would point out it's also our third consecutive year of Crack Rackets coverage of the national indoor finals. Is that a coincidence? Maybe not. North Carolina fans, in that case, you are welcome. But of course, simply put, this Tar Heel team was exceptional throughout the weekend. They answered every question that was asked of them for one win over Ohio State to kick things off. They then dropped the doubles point, earned four straight set victories to take a 4-1 win over conference foes Virginia. Take a doubles point against an NC State team that very rarely, if ever, loses doubles points, uh, ultimately then pushed to the brink. There was a three, five minute window there where you thought, oh my God, are the Tar Heels going to lose? They survived that 4-1 Jay, they drop doubles, they drop four first sets in singles, but sweep all six second sets and ultimately earn a 4-2 victory to capture their third consecutive national indoor title. It's eight consecutive finals for Coach Kalbis as well. The 10th consecutive year the team has played for a national championship as they didn't make the indoor finals in 14, but that season they made the NCAA final Carolina tennis is humming, and we talked about it all weekend on the on the broadcast. Blue Bloods versus New Bloods. In the end, it was the Blue Bloods in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, your national champions. Deservedly so, Jay. Deservedly so. Yeah, absolutely, right? I mean, they came out in that Ohio State match just dominant, and you're going, okay, this team clearly hasn't missed a beat, and and they they haven't. And I thought what was most interesting about that final is it was a little reminiscent of the Texas final last year where Texas came out, they won doubles immediately in very short order. They took singles first sets, and then UNC just fought back, right? It was Crawley and Scotty in those final few matches, and in very similar fashion, right? They dropped doubles to Oklahoma, as you said, they dropped four single sets and whether it be kind of the, uh, the, the never say die attitude that they had around wanting to win that third straight title, wanting to prove that they could do this without kind of those super seniors they had last year, whether it was the fresher legs that they had against Oklahoma, they found, a they found a way and it again, impressive and recalls their match against Texas where they, you know, came back from the brink. And so super impressive from UNC. They're clearly the team to beat indoors. Yeah. And you know, what's so interesting, the comparison is I think the clear one to make that said, this was a different sort of comeback because the energy level for North Carolina was just off to start this match in doubles and all of the credit in the world to Oklahoma boomer Sooners were echoing through that Nielsen tennis stadium through the first hour and a half of this match. Oklahoma had that adrenaline rush. You beat Texas who you only have beaten now twice in program history, right? And first time in about 20 years, you go ahead and beat Pepperdine and what was just a fantastic semifinal that goes, yeah, until 9 PM, it's a four hour match, right? Just absolutely sensational. They rode that adrenaline. They rode that energy to just outplaying the Tar Heels. They were the more aggressive, energetic, free-flowing team. It reminded me a lot of the USC-UNC men's final I saw in Madison in 2020, where same deal. It was the looser team, the more energetic team, not the team playing with expectations that ultimately captured the doubles point. And then again, just Oklahoma rode that energy into the start of singles. But what was so impressive, and again, to me, the difference between this year's team and last year's team. Last year, and I talked about this with Coach Calvis, you know, the moment singles started, Alexa Graham and Sarah Davitella were winning. Like, you could just tell. Their energy, their fire. You were just like, all right, Carolina's got two. Can they find four more? Then it just got funky. Then it was a battle, you know, survival of the fittest. Then it was just, you know, Scotty, Crawley, Shavatapan, and Lebrana, all these players just battling it out. This, you know, it, but it felt much more individual, I suppose, as a comeback. It was two fantastic individual efforts that ultimately brought the team forward. Four individual efforts, honestly, when you look across the board in singles. This year, it felt like a team effort. It felt like a coherent, cohesive push from the Tar Heels, not only from a tennis perspective, but from an energy perspective. And obviously that starts with Elizabeth Scotty, who dropped, what, seven games in her three victories on the weekend and earns a 6-2, 6-1 win over Corley at the number two single spot and was screaming her lungs out throughout the course of that singles run. 
just the energy she brought. And that's not Scotty, who is, you know, again, her teammates would die for her, but she's the kindest human in the world. And just to see that fire, that passion from her, it trickled over everywhere into Fiona Crawley, who, of course, again, relentless positivity and just the energy from Cam Mora and taking that second set against Lane Sleeve. Even Annika Yarlagata shouting her lungs out at six, Tan Gillig just staying so poised and when Riley Tran took that second set, and I think this moment epitomized it more than anything, you saw a fist bump from head coach Brian Calvis that, like, that's just not him. That's not what he does. And even he was fired up. You heard the Tar Heel now roaring across the building. It just felt like a cohesive push from a group that is untested together. Like, you lose Davitella, Graham, and Jones, and I apologize for the monologue, you're turning a page in your program history. You know, it's on to the next chapter. And yeah, you have more and Scotty back from the past two title runs. But this was a new group that did it together. And the energy they showed, Jay, they proved something to me. Yes, Carolina has always been good. But this was an unproven group that proved they also still have it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I'll, I'll defer to you on kind of the uh, sure. momentum swings. I felt feel like it did feel similar to the, like the Texas comeback that they had last year. Um, I don't totally buy this, like this is untested, unproven new faces. Like they had a, the luxury last year of having additional scholarship players on that roster in the three super seniors, five of the six players that they started on that roster were part of that championship team and played in the NCAA tournament, right? The only new addition is Tangulik. So yes, did Tran or Yarlagada, even Scotty at times, like not contribute as much as they did this year? Like, absolutely. But these are all players who have known each other, who have been on the team together for at minimum one year. This is a championship caliber squad, whether they had those three super seniors or not. And that's a, a credit to the te- like a testament to the cre- the caliber of this team for making it so far for so long. So that part is, I feel like standard. I here's where I disagree. You had the safety valves last year of Davitil and Graham up top, or you just felt if you were Carolina, if we're ever down, don't worry, they're going to bail us out because time after time, even in the Pepperdine match, they both bailed them out. You look for this group again, Mora stepping into the number one spot. She didn't get a win on the weekend, but she only lost once, and it was the first match against Oklahoma, uh, Ohio State in a match that was ultimately unconsequential that she lost and just getting, you know, leading in that second set against Navarro, getting that second set against Sleeth, and getting that second set against Jada Daniel as well. That sort of burden of leadership of that number one spot and that sort of responsibility, that's new to Cam Mora. And then again, Scotty just... Yes, she's always been good from the tennis perspective, but the leadership, the intangible qualities, you saw the two upperclassmen experienced hands step up. And then I just like, I don't know how you can say that after we know in these biggest moments that these pressure points and that is what separates how you do in those deuce points in those biggest stages. That's what separates the team that ultimately wins in May. And yeah, Yala got a clinched against Georgia last year in a 4-3 match in the regular season, but she had never played a national indoors and she clinches in three in both the semifinals and the finals. Tan Gillick, who had is a freshman and has still never lost a dual match, but she had never played a national indoors and she went undefeated throughout the course of the weekend. You're right. We know how good Crawley is. And I still think for Riley Tran to get that second set against Ivana Courtley and compete even when she's not playing her best, like we talk about gathering the data, this team now knows, you know what? We don't need the safety valves. We're fine without Graham and Davitella. Now on paper, I agree with you. You're like, they had the talent, but now this group actually knows, hey, we can do this on our own, this unit. Forget riding the Carolinas of ego, you know, of past. This group without those three is just as good. I mean, certainly relative to the field, right? Absolutely. And if- if that cohort of players needed that confidence boost, then like, this is what that this will give them that for sure that they can do this and they can do this without those players. I just didn't have those sorts of doubts and I'm not going to buy into this narrative that like, I mean, look at who's across the net. This is a team that's never even made national indoors. So like the relative experience between a quote untested Tran and Yarlagada and Scotty and Mora, like, Come on. 
like <laughs> that is like head and shoulders above the competition of, of who they're facing across the net. I don't know. I think we're just going to disagree on this one. Like I, I, I do. I don't think again, half the lineup hadn't played in a national indoor match in singles prior to this year's national indoor final field. Like, I, I don't think you can manufacture that sort of experience. I don't care how many dual matches you played. And so I do think there's a massive confidence boost that this team gets out of it. But even beyond that, you look at the talent we saw a, did Mora play her best? I would still say no, but she got better and better throughout the weekend. And she was not a liability at the number one spot for the heels. Scotty, you chalk up as a win, you know, Oh, I guess, you know, Scotty was just light. It was crazy. She was lights out in, in her victories, just that effective. And we knew how good Crawley would be at four, but to see Tran beat Negroho the way she did and just Tangillig fitting in a hand in a glove, the aggression of Yarla Gata, Give me the takeaways from a tennis perspective, particularly again, six second sets. Like they found the wave, they found the momentum. They ultimately survived Oklahoma's punch to win the title. Yeah. Um, I, I did think Mora started to look better and better as the matches were on. I thought it, her serve looked like less of a liability than it has been in the past. Um, so that was, that was good to see. I mean, off the ground, I thought she was stroking the ball really well, hanging in the rallies longer than I've seen in the past. So uh, overall, it's just a super impressive performance to stay for her to stay out there in a lot of those matches, right? I think that's uh, that's huge. You mentioned Scotty, like it's it's tough because it's like she yeah. steamrolled her the three matches and then she lost a, a somewhat surprising one to Renchali. I thought like her game would match up well with Scotty. I thought Scotty would love to take those rips. Um, I mean Tran Crawley. I do think Tran you know, stepping up to the top three, that's a big jump. Right. And so for her to do that and for her to serve herself, well, um, super impressive. Crawley feels like one of the closer things we'll have to a lock at number four. If she stays there, uh, Tangu Tangu is so slowly becoming like one of the steadier freshmen that we've seen across the country with a lot of other freshmen as well. Um, and Darla Gata played really well, right? She had the clinch at, in the semifinals clinch in the final, um, Overall, this team just looked really comfortable, right? They look comfortable indoors. They look comfortable in this environment. Um, you know, they they played aggressive when they needed to and were able to withstand a lot of the early punches from some of these teams or even the late comebacks like an NC State. Oh, and we talked about going into the season, the depth that this team has, the match calculus so clear. Even if they drop doubles, they are going for they can find four of two through six every time. It's yeah. just Yarla Gata goes 3-0-1 in the match she didn't finish. She was at 6-0 or 6-1-5-2, whatever, up. And just Tan Gillick, so steady as a freshman. And Mike brought up the tidbit. She never lost a high school match. She's now still never lost a college team match. The aggression she plays with, the forehand, the serve, it just looks really good at the five spot. Crawley can take your best shot, absorb, redirect. She, as you mentioned, as close to a lock as anything. And then... Yeah, the snap of that Tran two-handed forehand. Oh, my God, is it special. I just feel like she's going to be that much more effective outdoors, even compared to indoors, and just Scotty, Mora. This team is that good. And, again, a testament to the success and the work of Coach Calbus uh, that this North Carolina program has now made eight consecutive finals, a third consecutive championship, and it's become here a tradition at Crack Racket, seemingly at this point of the season, to speak with the head coach of the third consecutive national championship winning team. As such, we are so excited to have a snippet of my conversation with North Carolina women's tennis head coach, Brian Calvis for all of you here today, of course, to hear the complete interview, go check out the cracked interviews podcast feed tomorrow. But with that in mind, super producer, Daniel Westoff, let's get to my conversation with North Carolina head coach, Brian Calvis. Joining us on the show once again today for what seems like an annual tradition here at Crack Rackets is a man who just captured his sixth ITA national indoor title, of course, head coach of the University of North Carolina women's tennis team, our friend, Coach Brian Calvis. Coach, congratulations on another title. How are you feeling here on Tuesday? Uh, Alex, uh, thank you. It's uh, feeling great. Uh, we got in late last night, but... Um, it's wonderful to uh, to wake up, uh, you know, feeling that uh, sense of satisfaction and being a national champion uh, again. So it's been it's been great, uh, great twenty four hours. 
No, I can only imagine. I woke up this morning feeling sore, and like I didn't even coach or play any matches, and so I can only imagine how you and the team must be feeling. I would also point out, Crack Rackets has done the broadcast the past three seasons, North Carolina winners of the past three national indoor titles. I don't think that's a coincidence, Coach, just throwing it out there, but obviously, you look at what your team did yesterday— Let's just start with the doubles point. You know, just the first swing of momentum. You guys dropped doubles. You dropped four first sets in singles as well. Let's start there. What's going through your head in that moment of the national final? Uh, honestly, uh, I felt I didn't do a very good job preparing our team <laughs> okay. uh, for the onslaught that uh, we were in, being, you know, ensuing by Oklahoma. They uh, they came out, and I knew I knew they were playing very good doubles. They won the three previous days doubles point um and we've been a little shaky we did real well uh, kind of coming back from the virginia match and played really well against nc state and doubles but um i knew they were going to be very emotionally charged up and a fiery team but they they were that was, they came out with so much energy and, and so much fight and so much aggressiveness that i was not expecting that um and i didn't again i don't think i did a very good job preparing our team but um after doubles uh, I just, I, you know, I told him that that's not who we are. You know, we're, you know, th- you know, we need to show who we are, a competitive team, feisty team, emotional, uh, and, and just, and I, and I, I told him, I said, I, I, I sense the same thing that, you know, last year when we played Texas, that we just kind of, you know, again, the Texas one was much quicker, uh, quicker death, but, um, you know, the singles got, we got sim- similar situation. We got off to a slow start, um, but I've never been a part of a team that comes back and wins six, second sets after losing the doubles point in that situation in, a, in an emotional tough environment like that we were faced last last night so um just really proud of our team and how we were uh able to withstand you know such a you know a tough feisty emotional team but we you know we showed a lot of grit we showed a lot of toughness and um and and again we've had players in different positions everybody was in different positions than they're used to and accustomed to so that was nice to see, you know, different people, uh, new positions all step up. Uh, you know, we need it. And again, when I said before, when you lose a doubles point, you need all six players to really, you know, make an impact. And we were able to do that. Well, I'm glad you bring up those players who rose to new positions. And for those unaware, Riley Tran, who, you know, prior to this week had lost one match in her career, never in a dual match. And now she's up to the number three singles position this year. And, you know, uh, you've got Annika Yarlegato, who's had a ton of success, but stepping into that number six spot, obviously Carson Ten Gillig, the freshman, stepping up into that number five spot. Yes, you guys were back-to-back champions coming into this event. But did this feel like a new group? You know, did you feel like, again, with this team, it was it, 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 kind of turning the page, right? This is a next chapter of Carolina tennis? Completely. We had um, uh, we had so many question marks going in, and we didn't have a lot of uh, chances to get those questions answered. You know, we were hoping that the Georgia match would give us some kind of idea. Um, the Michigan match in the road um, kind of – uh, gave us a snapshot of what we what we could be. Annika, in front of her family and friends, just was an emotional wreck, honestly. Yeah, um, sure. So we didn't quite know what she was going to bring to the table. Um, but, um, you know, Cam playing number one um, and doing so well at that position, giving us a chance to win every single match was incredible. And, you know, that's what you need. You, know, you need somebody to take on the, their best point and to compete the way she did. You got Liz Biscotti, who uh, I know I've heard a lot of your talks. That was a big question mark. How, what's her health going to be like? And for her to play four matches in four days, singles and doubles, and not miss a beat, and 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 really put that first singles point on the board for us was gigantic. Um, and and to play her best tennis her last day, uh, the last day, and then Riley. Uh, well, Riley, and I don't I don't mean to interrupt you, but can I? I just want to ask you about those top two because Cam in particular, who I think goes. 0-1-3 oh, on the week, but clearly got better and better. And, you know, for her to get, you know, be leading in that second set against Emma after dropping the doubles point against Virginia. And then yesterday to take that second set against Lane and just, you know, came out swinging with her fire. And then Scotty, who you only get an hour of because she's on or off the court and playing so well. 
Even beyond the tennis, though, I do want to talk about the leadership that I saw from them. And this is one of the things I love about being there in person because they are now the upperclassmen. They are two people who contributed to those back-to-back national championship runs. And I saw a fire from them. And I want to say Scotty in particular. I didn't know Scotty could get that loud. And just the emotion, the energy they showed. Did you feel that as well as coach? Because I know, you know, it's the two sets of banks, right? But I just felt like you could hear the Scotty roars, the Mora roars echoing throughout Nielsen. Yeah, I mean, I talked to both of them before, uh, right, right before the match, you know, uh, yesterday in Oklahoma. And um, they both, the, the look on the, in their faces and their eyes, they were ready. They were ready to go. They were ready to go to battle. And they kind of knew what they were, they were going to be up against. Cam knew playing sleep that she was going to have to kind of grind and compete and and play some tennis and shots that she's maybe not used to or comfortable, but she was ready. I mean, he mentally, physically ready. And for her to come back, have to lose that first set and get off such a great start, winning, you know, a bunch of those no ad points in the second um, was huge for our team. And, and Scotty just did not let Carmen uh, get into the match. I mean, Scotty, I think she wanted to kind of uh, right the ship. Uh, you know, she, you know, she losing NC state the way she did. She just, she just laughed it off. I was like, I just got, I just got blown out. And that doesn't really happen a lot with Scotty, but, and after the match when Scott, Scotty wanted to get off the court quickly. So, cause she wanted to start really making an impact with her teammates cheering. And I, I told her, I've never seen her cheer and get excited. And she stood on court too, where she played and just really emotionally charged up the rest of the, the group screaming for Veronica, screaming for Carson, screaming for Fiona, uh, you know, across the, you know, the stadium there. And, um, but yeah, Cam, Cam is such a leader. Uh, the way she com- the way she competes, she she never takes a point off. She practices that way. You know, you know what you're going to get with her because she's going to give an amazing effort. Um, and her attitude is is so good. I mean, her her positivity just exudes throughout the you know the rest of the team. Yeah, and you know, again, uh, I want to ask you about all of the players. But last two for you here. Um, a, we when you look at you know the, again the effort of your team. You talk about Riley Tran, who may not have won yesterday's match, but when she won that second set, I watched you give a fist pump that I swear I have never seen before out of you, Coach Calvis. Just like a roar and just, we needed that. That six, you know, second sets, there we go. Talk to me again about that fight, that second set push you saw, that wave from, because you guys had your back against the wall and this new unit responded. What does that show you as a coach? Well, you, you're 100% right. I sense that if Riley wins this second set, it changes the whole momentum of the match, okay? And um, and she was struggling physically, and I felt that she needed that emotional just, you know, burst. That, you know what? I, I, I need to do my part to help the team. Even though she was not, not 100%, um, I want her to know that, you know what? I, I really I can't thank her enough and appreciate enough the amount of effort she's giving to help the team kind of get some momentum. And, you know, if they would have gotten that match done quickly and got a point on the board, it would have changed things dramatically. But her on our side with her and and Cam getting those second sets and Riley just kind of, and then getting off to a four, two start in the third, I know she didn't win, but getting off to that four, two start in the third really, really uh, made a huge difference and and allowed, I think I, I felt to me, just given the other side a little bit more breathing room. And then Fiona, you know, getting that next point on the board, you know, because there she was down 4-3 in the second. And so that could have changed. They could have lost, you know, she could have lost that set and that could have changed momentum. But her getting that point on the board for us to get, you know, a lead 2-1 um, was was gigantic. And then Carson and then obviously Annika getting off to, you know, getting winning close sets in the second, and then you know, basically getting off to really strong third sets, really you know, kind of helped us get that momentum. No, absolutely. And now again, talking about that momentum, this is a position you and your team have been in before. Third consecutive year, you've won the national indoor title. I know this team, your program, eyes on May always. You guys want to capture that first NCAA run. Well, I think it. I think it bodes well for this team knowing that they they establish some confidence and they they establish a, a team identity um that this team needed to establish uh this early in the season so i think that the um that was by far the you know yesterday's match the grittiest team uh performance that i that i've seen um in in, in such an emotional high pressured situation because we were facing a team that prides themselves on grit and and toughness 
and and as Audra said, nastiness. So uh, you know, we were able to kind of uh, basically out tough them. You know, when it mattered, and you could tell. You know, they were loud. They were, uh, you know, at times obnoxious and boisterous. But you could tell as the match went on, they were getting more. Um, uh, uh, not, I wouldn't say they they're, they were getting more quieter. Okay, they they're, 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 they were not the the, the, the screaming, the, the sooner stuff. All that was kind of going a little bit, you know, to the what the wayside. And our team was, you know, kind of letting our rackets do more of the talking. And we were getting more, you know, more confident as the match went along. So to answer your question, I think that really. We took, we took, even though we're, we have a new team, we're still ranked high. I don't think that's justified, but we took everybody's best shot. Virginia, yeah. North Carolina State, they, they felt that this was, this was their time to beat us in this tournament, and they have really, really, really good programs, and, 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 and their, their time is going to come. But we were able to take their best shots, and, and with a new team, new roles, able to, uh, to, to team, you know, can improve on. And now that we know what our identity is, we're excited to kind of have the next two months to see what we can do to improve on these areas that, that hopefully will make a difference for us, you know, come May time. You talked about grit. Absolutely. And I know I just get excited for these matches no matter what, but I had goosebumps watching your team compete because you guys got your back pushed against the wall. Doubles, four first sets. But I mean, the way your team fought off across the board, I was joking on the broadcast. I don't think a team has ever lost a match after winning six second sets. And I continue to be proven right because, you know, you guys didn't lose the match after taking those six uh, second sets. So coach, congratulations on another fantastic title. And obviously we will be watching and wishing you and your team health and success throughout the rest of 2022. Thank you very much, Alex. Appreciate it. Well, a huge thank you again to head coach Brian Calvis and a congratulations to the North Carolina program. Back to back to back titles, eight consecutive national indoor finals. The North Carolina Tar Heels are the definition of a blue blood in women's college tennis continue to set the standard for what is possible. But of course, they were pushed to the brink, Jay by their opponents in the final Oklahoma, who were unequivocally the rising star of the national indoor event. And it was their first appearance in the final 16 field. And, you know, they looked comfortable in a victory over Wisconsin in round one, but then to beat Texas 4-1 the way that they did, to beat Pepperdine 4-1 the way that they did, and then ultimately, of course, to take the doubles and four first sets in singles what a run for this Oklahoma team who is still without Dana Guzman, their number two singles player from last season who lost one big 12 match throughout the course of the year. I mean, oh, uh, excuse me, 4-2 against Pepperdine. I said 4-1, but Oklahoma was sensational. Like no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This was Coach Audra Cohen and the team's announcement to the college tennis world. Hey, we're here and we're not going anywhere. Yeah, I mean, you talk about untested. Oklahoma is the definition of that, right? Uh, arriving to... <laughs> National indoors, having never played the event before and making it all the way to the finals. That's an incredible feat to just even defend that one, just even get that win over Texas, right? You mentioned some of the accolades, second time in program history, first ever win over number one ranked team. That's an incredible emotional feat to be to rival like that, to then back it up against to have that win over Pepperdine and then really back it up again with such a solid performance against North Carolina. What a Cinderella story. Uh, It's been really fun to watch. It was fun to watch all weekend. I do have to eat a little bit of crow though. You know, I've been a fan of the Oklahoma team uh, and and pretty high on them for the season. But when I was previewing this, uh, I, I mentioned that Oklahoma lost the draw, that they were the draw losers. Well, they turned that around, right? I thought maybe they would lose to Texas and then maybe lose to the loser of AM and Cal. But ultimately, you know, making it to the finals, an incredible display. They looked like veterans out there, right? And so it was uh, an incredibly impressive performance from the Sooners. The Corleys went 4-0 at number one doubles. And as two of the main returners to this program, they set the tone for what was expected and just the energy this team brought. And it wasn't just the players the coaching staff, the roars from them, you know, not just yeah. the players announcing, hey, we've taken a set. Hey, we've taken a break. But the coaches screaming from court to court and just, you know, the energy their fans brought as well. Again, these boomer sooner chants were not, I'm, not, I'm not being hyperbolic. They were that frequent throughout the course of the weekend. They were outstanding and just 
what Lane Sleeth brought to that number one singles position, she's never going to go down easily. She's such a tough out, even against Peyton Stearns. You know, yes, she lost that match, but Peyton had to play some extraordinary tennis uh, in that second set to get over the finish line. And obviously, you know, extending the match three sets with Fakuda and the three sets she played and taking that first set, the boost that gave her team in the final as well against Mora. It, there's just a physicality she brings to that number one spot. And you're like, she's doing this indoors. What's it going to look like outdoors? Of course, the aggression of both Corleys, but in particular, Ivana, who as the junior leader just brought that energy intensity, played so aggressive and on her terms from the start. And then like, with all due respect to Pisareva, like the freshmen, Shanta and Staker, they're so talented and it's still so early in their career, but they you can just tell they both have it. And for Staker, who's just as comfortable grinding six feet behind the baseline as she is stepping up and playing the ball big and on the rise and down the line, and she has the weapons. And for those two to fight the way they did at that number three double spot in the finals to not roll over to the experienced team of Sanford and Tran, you know, again, all weekend long, there were 4-0 in the doubles point. And you know who's feeling great this weekend? Jamie Ashworth, who's sitting there in Durham being like, I told you all, like, we're really good at Duke. Oklahoma's just exceptional. Like, Oklahoma is exceptional. And they proved it. And this was indoors. And this was without still Dana Guzman. Like, just across the board, I think what's so fun about this team is they can find four points in so many different ways. And they're winning doubles points as well. It's just like... You know, again, North, it, it, it was day four. I do think one thing for Oklahoma, they did hit a bit of a wall physically in hour three of that final. And you can understand why just the mental and physical toll of beating Texas, the mental and physical toll of playing the later semifinal on day three. That said, again, for th- this team hasn't peaked yet, I think is the scary part. And they're playing so well to start the season. Yeah, and not to take any away from North Carolina, right, but I think you do hit on something that felt pretty apparent in that final that Oklahoma did hit probably both a physical and emotional wall of the last three days. And so I think that was that was tough. And I think, you know, UNC on on fresher legs, you know, was able to pull through in those second and third sets. But look, the scary thing about this result for Oklahoma is they're probably hungrier now than they would be had they gone like, oh, and three, right. And just realize, oh, we're not even at this level. No, they realize that they're at this level. They want to beat North Carolina. They are hungry for the outdoor season. And I mean, they know what they need to work on now. And, you know, people better watch out because, you know, Audra Cohen's going to have them very well prepared in three months. Well, that was the other thing, just the energy surrounding this team, surrounding this program. They were so hung. It, it, the, the combination of confidence, belief and hunger, just yeah. like they had it all and they were not afraid of any opponent they faced. And there was they're almost, you know, the naivete of, well, we've never been on this stage. And all we've done this year is win. That's really all we know how to do right now. So, yeah, we're going to keep fighting. Yeah, we're going to find a way to come back and win. And just, again, for them to beat Pepperdine the way that they did and just the physicality of that match, the emotion of that match for them to have played Texas the day before and just bounced back. And, you know, there was nowhere or tear on the body. And the, the energy they brought really felt like it was the difference down the home stretch. I mean, Yeah, like they're what nine and one, 10 and one to start the season. Their only loss being in the national indoor final to University of North Carolina. It's about an ideal of a script as you could have drawn up for uh, Coach Cohen and the Sooners. And I think the most exciting part is they've got at least one more matchup with Texas, at least one more matchup with Pepperdine, right? We're going to continue to get to see this team tested. And I think that's good for this group because, again, They are young and now they've tasted success and there's nothing, you know, of course they want to win the title, but the really cool thing for coach Cohen and the team now is you can go back and say, Hey, we still got to get better. Like we have come close. Now, you know what it feels like next time. Let's get over the hump. Yeah, absolutely. And you kind of look back to, we made the parallels between UNC and Texas match last year. You look at this Oklahoma team, like, could they be the Texas of this season, right? Where probably people didn't expect them to make the indoor final. They do. They come very close. What sort of motivation and fuel does that give them for the next three months in ways that other teams don't have? And they clearly have the talent on paper. They know what now they need to be focused on. They are still without one of their top players, you know, 
if you get Guzman back in the lineup, even if you don't get Guzman back in the lineup, right? Who knows the status of her health? This is a team that has should have, you know, deep aspirations come May and will continue to be t- tested, which I think is the best thing for them. Yeah. And again, so many things to build off of the double success they had all weekend long, the success of the freshman Sleeth and the fight she showed at one, the Corleys. And, you know, again, I think Carmen Corley didn't play her best tennis Agreed. this weekend, had some really tough opponents, obviously, in Lisa Zar and Elizabeth Scotty. And, you know, that's never going to change, but you throw Guzman into the mix. And now everyone's down a spot and you just can mix things up by matchup and all these keep a player fresh when needed. Team's got options. They've got talent everywhere. They're young. This is not the last we're going to be hearing about the Oklahoma Sooners, who, of course, as I mentioned, knocked off Pepperdine 4-2 in what was such a fun semifinal. And both semifinals were incredible. But let's start uh, with Pepperdine, who we had as our number one team entering the season, number one in our college contender series. And obviously on paper, they've got all of the talent in the world and they're all experienced as well, right? Except for Savannah Brodus, you bring in a Vicky Flores who has been an all American and a part of some really good teams in Georgia tech and Janice Chen, who made semifinals last year of the NCAAs and singles. And, you know, you add that to the nucleus, you're already bringing back in Fakuda in patch Galeva, Nikki Redelick, who we saw this season, There are so many options for this Pepperdine roster, and yet you look for them, you know, again, 4-1 over Old Dominion in a match that is far closer than that 4-1 scoreline suggests. 4-1 over Cal in a match that was far closer than that scoreline suggests. I mean, it was 4-2 against Oklahoma. Could have been 4-3. Like, it was a pick sort of match. They played three really physical battles. There were some silver linings, in my opinion, uh, but I'll let you go first. What's your takeaway from Pepperdine after this weekend? Well, look, I mean, they went two and one. So, you know, that's that's solid for them. They're not a indoor team. So they didn't suffer um, some of the surprising first round losses like we saw Cal against Michigan. We saw um, USC kind of struggle a little bit this weekend. So overall, I thought there are a lot of good takeaways for Pepperdine. Uh, most notably, I thought, um, you know, Lisa Czar has looked really solid. And I thought the turnaround that we've seen from Janice Chen has been a much needed improvement, uh, something that they've been looking to count on. And then I thought you could see the growth Savannah Brodus had just within the the weekend, right in her three matches. I mean, for her to go toe to toe with Katja Weirsholm in that match, I thought she played really well, start to use her weapons appropriately at the right time. So overall, I thought there were spots that they can feel really good about. I think look, they know they're super talented. We've talked about just like line for line. They're the most talented team on paper in the country. And it's just about looking at a team like Oklahoma who feels feels like they operate as a team unit and how do they get there, right? What are the pieces that they need to get? Obviously there were some players who suffered some setbacks this weekend, Patch Galeva being one of them. Uh, I hope the injury to Vicky Flores isn't that serious. That was really difficult to watch. Uh, but overall, I think, look, this is a talented team. They have are used to suffering some of these um, early season losses, right? Like at indoors last year where they were without Ashley Leahy and look how that turned out for them still turned out pretty good. So, you know, I still think Pepperdine has, has, they definitely still have the talent to make it deep in May. Pepperdine one and two at last year's national indoors, losing four, two to UNC and UCLA, I would agree with everything you said. And I do think this team from a chemistry standpoint, they have it. They really do like each other. Vicky Flores has brought an energy component, a verbal, like just a loudness. I I don't know how else to describe it that you just need to have when things, you know, backs are pushed against the wall and you need to know, Hey, we are all here fighting with one another. One needs to hear you from court six and vice versa. They have that Janice Chen her energy, just that she brought the positivity, the fire, the forehand. Oh my goodness. Can Janice Chen hit up the freaking forehand? If she's playing in the bottom three of the lineup, again, about as close to a lock as you're going to find in college tennis. And it wouldn't shock me at all to see her jump into the top three and stay there. If Vicky Flores is out for any time with that ankle injury, I would also say this, if Vicky doesn't injure that ankle, I'm not saying Ivana Corley loses the match by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm also not saying she wins it 
because that was a toss up. It was four, three in the first set. They were battling back and forth, matching one another's energy, the fire in that match. It was going to be a fun one folks. And it was just so unfortunate that we didn't get to see both players at their best. And I do think Flores's injury clearly impacted Corley's level uh, very much. So moving through the rest of the match, but like they were right there with Pepperdine. And they beat Cal after last time not being able to get over that hump and that it was, you know, again, Brodus playing Kaya Wiersholm even and, you know, Nikki Redelick being able to step up into that number six spot. Those are little things you're looking for. I also think Fakuda is playing really well right now at the number one spot. Lisa Zar just so lights out physically, mentally locked in at number two. Flores did not play well this weekend. That manifested itself more in doubles than anything else. And I do think you're still looking for answers in doubles. But I love Brodus Chen. They've got something there. That's a team, no doubt. The energy, the firepower, that's a team. Zar and Flores are good. Yamashkin and Fakuda are better than they showed this weekend. And again, there are more pieces on the bench to pull from. This team will continue to get better. Uh, that I maybe is that like the glass half full take is like they are not nearly at their ceiling yet and they're still playing pretty damn well. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, two and one and they lost to Oklahoma, who yeah. has been on a tear. So, I mean, yeah. like they were the Cinderella story of the tournament and, you know, you were a byproduct pro- byproduct of that run. Look, Pepperdine is going to turn their eyes outdoors. They're going to be glad to have this indoor season behind them. And, you know, they have a we've talked about that schedule. So they're going to have a lot of opportunities to get tested, to play around with their lineup if they need to. I think they should be glass half full, right? I think it's I think it's good to get these tests uh, early in the season. They have done it before. I don't really have any concerns other than uh, other than health, which I hope everyone is healthy. I would agree with you there. I do think Pepperdine is that good, and so I do. I feel very good about them. Having watched them play, you could just tell they weren't playing their best, and yet even not at their best, they can compete with just about anyone. On the flip side. You look at a team who, in my opinion, did play their best this weekend, NC State, and in particular across the board, whether it was Nell Miller, who plays Fiona Crawley even, right, fights off match points, and just, you know, her and Jada Daniel at the number two double spot, exceptional. And, you know, that North Carolina beat North Carolina State in doubles. That was a surprising result because NC State, excellent in doubles against Auburn, steal the doubles point after being down six match points at the number two spot uh, and take a 4-2 win again over. Georgia there was five minutes where you thought they were gonna you know don't let that 4-1 score line fool you there were five minutes when Jada Daniel was up big in the third set on Cam Mora when Nell Miller had fought off a match point and was you know up on and serving for the match against Fiona Crawley and Rejecki at six was up serving for the match 5-4 on Yar Legata. it was like oh my god they're gonna beat North Carolina now ultimately Carolina fought back and that's a credit to the Tar Heels once again but you look at this NC State team still without number one uh, last year's number two singles player and likely would have played number one if healthy at the start of this year. Alana Smith. They're very good in doubles and you feel like you already have teams even before you work Alana Smith back into the rotation and then just the depth they showed everywhere. Prisca Negrojo looks excellent as a freshman and just yeah, everything fits. I, I, this was a good weekend for the Wolfpack. Yeah, it definitely was. I mean, this feels like a team that came in callous, which we knew, and that mm-hmm. seemed to have paid off, right? And, and they found themselves down in positions and they were able to come back, whether it was doubles or, or in singles, just a super impressive, feisty performance throughout the entire weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, you bring up that injury to Vicky Flores, like Nell Miller was not 100% in that match. And so, you know, the, these teams are all very close. And I just thought NC State showed a, a, a maturity and a feistiness that I talked about that, you know, was was not representative of the experience they've had on this stage. Right. Because they are still new here. Right. They've only been to indoors and certainly semifinals and beyond a handful of times. So overall, I was super impressed. Um, I think they need to figure out Jada Daniel at number one. She runs pretty hot and cold. And so I think having a more consistent performance at the top of the lineup will be something that they'll want to rely on moving forward. But you mentioned the depth. Uh, and so that's going to be a big, I was really impressed by their depth, their performances at four or five and six throughout the, um, throughout the entirety of the tournament. Yeah, they were excellent. And just, you know, again, I do think 
this team will never win pretty, right? It's never seemingly clear cut that they, they scrap out a match from Sophie yes. Abrams at five. Now I do think Negroho and Mike Cation fired off to take that. He thinks she can be an all American this season. She's a former top 10 junior in the world. Her game is so smooth. How comfortable she is moving forward. Does she have the overwhelming plus one weapon, the overwhelming power? No, but she is good at everything. She was excellent. When Jada Daniels is clicking, she can hit her way through anyone. And I thought when Shelly at two played so, I mean, she crushed Scotty. Like, yeah. you're the only one who did it. Uh, credit to her there. Clearly something's clicking. If they get Alana Smith back healthy, there's absolutely no reason this team can't compete. And if clicking, win a national title. Because we joke about that Simon Earnshaw and the system they play. This is a team that executes down the home stretch. This is a team that executes its playbook, whether it's up or down on the scoreboard and just hit big, play to your targets, look to move forward, be the aggressor. This team does that extraordinarily well. And so, yeah, I think this is one team of many that have a shot to capture the title. And with that in mind, I want to talk about our five other biggest takeaways uh, from the national indoor event. And that's where I want to start when we talk about, again, other takeaways from this event beyond just who our semifinalists was. I think the first one to me, Jay, is that there is no clear cut favorite right now for the NCAA title. Obviously, North Carolina wins another national indoor title. And certainly we knew from the beginning they were going to be in the hunt for uh, the title come May. But I think Pepperdine will continue to get better. NC State, Oklahoma down a player. Cal looked really, really young at times, and they're going to continue to get better. And, you know, again, you have teams like Texas A&M that's won whatever happened at that number six single spot away from point away from Cal for um, advancing to the quarterfinals. I think Florida's way better than they showed this weekend, not necessarily national title good, but I'm just saying, I think there are a lot of teams that were in the mix this weekend and played well. There's no clear cut front runner to me. Yeah, I mean, the winner of the National Indoors hasn't won NCAA since 2017. So shout out to, to Florida. So, you know, we're used to seeing this happen, right? And, and I would agree with that. I mean, all the teams you mentioned, we didn't even mention Texas, right? Defending yeah. NCAA champion. Or Virginia, who, who have or, the, like Navarro, Subash, Travinsky, all these options. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And right. And we're talking about these pieces like, well, this team's down a player or this team got injured. And at the end of the day, like, North Carolina played incredible. I think a lot of factors that helped uh, solidify that victory as well. And so there's a ton of parity here at the top. I think you could make an argument for eight teams come May who could be playing the best ball. And so it, it's pretty incredible, you know, for particularly for women's tennis, where it's been so dominated by Stanford and then Florida sneaking in a few titles. And then in the past few years, you saw like Vanderbilt sneak in, right? You saw Texas win their first title in 20 years last year. More teams are capable of competing for a national title. And it feels like every year that margin widens just a little bit. And this year, it feels like the widest it's ever been. No, Stanford is still very good, by the way. And we lose 4 3 to a Virginia team that goes 2 and 1 on the weekend and took it to North Carolina in doubles. Yep. You still have Navarro at the number one spot, who, in my opinion, I test wise, was the best player at the event. Peyton Stearns was really freaking good, but I just, there's a smoothness to Navarro and her ability to respond to everything her opponent throws at her. Stearns has that forehand, you know, again, when the forehand is landing for Stearns, she's just playing on her terms. I just think Navarro would be able to disrupt those terms. Anyways, Virginia was excellent. Like Duke is still really good and really young. And by the way, they lose to an Oklahoma team that, you know, goes on to make the final. They lost 4-2 to Oklahoma. Pepperdine lost 4-2 to Oklahoma. I'm telling you, Duke's right there. Michigan just beat Cal. You know, they weren't in the final 16 here. And I know that was indoors, but still, there's a lot of talent across the board. You feel like USC didn't play their best this weekend. And, you know, teams like Baylor, Miami, who played them so close, would have loved to see how they competed. There's a lot of depth. There's a lot of talent. You know, whoever I'm glad you talked about Texas, who looked really young, but just wait till we see what they're going to look like in May. There are a lot of front runners, you know, or there are a lot of favor or a lot of contenders, I should say, uh, for the titles, uh, but no clear front runner. I also think we have to talk about the battle for the top 16 because the battle to be a top 16 and a host region come the NCAA tournament is going to be brutal. 
And that's why if you're Texas a and I, I don't think they were ultimately going to struggle uh, come the end, but you, just to be sure, like, yeah, we're two and one and we end up bouncing back and getting a win over USC and getting a win over Old Dominion. It just provides you a little margin for error, right? Moving forward. And, you know, for Auburn to get the win over Washington, that's critical for them. For Ohio State to steal four, three victories uh, against Florida and against Auburn, they're feeling good coming out of the weekend as well. I mean, for Cal, they're very happy to have gotten that win over AM, particularly after losing uh, the way they did to Michigan. Texas has to be happy after bouncing back and getting the win over Cal in their final match as well let alone being a top eight seed. I mean, top 16, it's going to be a photo finish. Yeah. And that's, that's really the B card here for indoors, right? Is like who gets those wins one and two, just to secure those non-conference victories that will pay dividends when the ranking formula starts to increase. And, uh, and you look at may rankings, right? Having two non-conference wins over teams in the SEC. If you're in the Pac-12, like those become so valuable. So you're right. All of those teams who make it to indoors do have that leg up if they secure those victories. Question for you. Okay. Over under four and a half teams from indoors do not become a top 16 seed. Okay. That's a very good question. And I don't want to be rude and call out any specific schools. So I'm you know, I didn't ask you to name. No, any. I know. I don't know. No, no. I, I know you didn't. So I'm going to try and think in my head quietly. Three and a half is tough. Four and a half is tough. I would take the slightest under just the slightest. I'm going to say four. I'm going to say four, but okay. four and a half is good. Like, I mean, I'll let you say the school so you can get in trouble. I, it's close, right? Like there are a bunch of schools where what's that Texas A&M Florida match? If one of them slips up or Georgia, they all beat up on each other. And then a Vanderbilt sneaks off a win or a Mississippi sneaks a win off of them or something like that as well. And, you know, again, UCLA has not played well to date, but if they bounce back in the Pac-12 regular season, what does that do to Washington? What does that do to USC? And obviously Stanford wasn't here this weekend. I mean, again, only Ohio State was there for the Big Ten. So can teams like Ohio State, uh, like Northwestern and Michigan and et cetera, build up enough, you know, really help for Michigan? And Cal would have loved to see Cal beat Texas if you're a Michigan fan. But still, Cal's got that win over Pepperdine and Cal's got a win over A&M and Michigan's got a win over that. So that helps everyone there. It's just wide open. It really is like Oklahoma State, not going anywhere. Tennessee, not going anywhere. Yep. There are 25 top 16 teams. ODU going one in or, you know, three and four over this seven match stretch, right? You beat Georgia Tech, you beat Ole Miss, you beat Wisconsin. You would have really loved to have snuck one out over a Pepperdine, right? Or over a Miami, over a Florida. Unfortunately for them, you know, obviously they get tripped up and are much closer than it says 4 1 scoreline against Texas AM. I mean, you would if you could have gotten one of those four would have helped that much more. They're still in the hunt though for 16, right? Like they're not, you can't cross them off as they go one and two. Yeah, I mean, I think ODU is tough in particular just because they don't have the conference schedule to get some of these additional wins. And I'm not sure that the wins over Georgia Tech and Ole Miss are necessarily going to appreciate in value. If they could have swept Georgia Tech, Ole Miss, and Miami, who are all more bubble than Florida, who's very likely going to be a top six team. If you could have swept the, you know, the bubble teams, that would have been, I, to me, like that would have been the punch card. Well, they, yeah, because I'm just not sure Georgia Tech and Ole Miss are going to, yeah. going to pay off. I think Miami is going to be solid. So I'll take the over. I'll take five. Um, you know, and the reason why I said four and a half is the, I, I'll, I'll share uh, the teams I had on the bubble here were uh, ODU, Wisconsin, Washington, USC, uh-huh. and then a split between Florida and Auburn, like yeah. one SEC team. No, it, it's fair. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's a really good number. I would say four. I think one of those, because like if USC does, not the Pac-12 is going to get one, like, right? It's got to be someone. Yeah. Is it Stanford? Is it USC? Um, it's tough. It's really, really tough. Um, so it's it's going to be fun uh, to watch how this unfolds. Uh, of course, again, we want to know. That's a good question for those tuning in here live. And obviously feel free to tweet at us if you're listening to the podcast form at Al Gruskin at Tennis Over under 
four and a half teams who made the national indoor field not getting to host regionals come the NCAA tournament. Uh, I think that was, again, that battle for top 16, the depth, the parity, certainly one of the takeaways at all, as always, from an event like this. Another one, the freshman, Jay, they are good. They are very, very good. And certainly prominently in that final, Tangillig and Staker and Shanta. But you look at a team like Pepperdine, Savannah Brodus, the energy and firepower she brings both to doubles in the back half of a lineup in singles. Kaya Wiersholm. Oh my God, the way she moves the ball around the court, the lefty just, again, remind it, it looks like a young Arena Contos. I mean, honestly, it looks like Arena Contos right now as well. They're just She's just, she has it. Um, and I, there are countless other freshmen. I am sure I am forgetting the ones at Duke and Stanford. And again, teams not here. Sure. The Georgia ones that you were high well. on. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mel Riasco, obviously. And then, yeah, Via Manova. Oh my God, is she good? Like yep. just tall, can attack, can fluid mover, big serve. This is a really good freshman class. Yeah. And it include it. The freshman class includes Sarah Hamner and Connie Ma and Yepa Finova, all of whom were not here. It's it's an incredibly talented freshman class, and it's in stark contrast to the men's freshman class, which is like lacking in any you know top twenty five, top thirty singles players. But overall, just super impressed with the quality of the freshmen. The ones that we saw this weekend, I felt you know we had talked about this in the preview, like hey, how will these freshmen adapt to playing national indoors? Yes, they've maybe been in some dual environments, but this is a, a national tournament. This is a big stage. And I felt like they all adapted extremely well. I mean, you look at Emma Staker had some of the most incredible matches of the tournament. We talked about um, Shanta and Nugrohu, just how impressive their games were. Didn't get to see as much of the Georgia freshmen once they got knocked out. But overall, it wasn't just the talent of these freshmen, which is exciting for us as we watch them develop long term. But just the maturity that they played with was uh, was one of the more impressive aspects. I completely agree with you. By the way, Scotty B says he takes the over with you, Jay. He'll say over four and a half. Shout out to you, Scotty B. And shout out, by the way, to the chat. On day three of the national indoors, unfortunately, or excuse me, day on the four. final. Yeah, day four of the national indoors. Unfortunately, obviously, when you're commentating, don't want to be too locked in that. I got to follow the action for all of you to steer the ship. But from what I hear, it was popping. That's a huge credit to you, Jay. Huge credit to Scotty B, I'm sure, as well. Um, yeah, again, really, really fun weekend and watching all of these freshmen compete. The scary thing for all of them, like the Via Manovas of the world. The only, I actually think the most complete of them right now is Negroho. But for all of them, it's just like give them 50 more deuce points to play and just yeah. wait till they understand, like, you got to be aggressive in those big moments. Don't get tentative because that's the kiss of death. They're all going to be so exceptional and they already are exceptional. And so the future of college tennis remains strong. All right. I don't know if this is a takeaway, but more just, again, got to be provocative. Give the fans what they want. Time to panic button. Let's just run through the case, and I am very certain the answer is going to be no on all of these questions, but let's just go through them. Texas, 2-1 and one on the weekend. They looked young, though. Like, again, Vrutsky and uh, Zinalova and just all of them looked like they needed 50 more deuce points. Now, Peyton Stearns looked damn good at that number one spot. She goes 3-0 and on the weekend, three impressive wins. Her serve, her forehand, she seems just, again, even – fitter than before and just more confident and just she's playing great tennis. You know, I think Kylie Collins played competitive matches across the board. I don't think she played poorly this weekend in singles, but it's new doubles pairings. And like they struggled in doubles, no doubt about that. And I do think, again, Uvrutsky and all, Zinalova, all of these young players just need a few more deuce points. Shavatapan is not playing her best, but got a much needed win to end the tournament against Cal. It's very clear Texas is not at their ceiling yet, but it was a stark reminder that like, yeah, th hey, the oldest player in the singles line appears a sophomore. Yeah, I mean, there's two sides of this coin, right, for Texas. One, you have the experience, quote unquote, with, with the sophomores. And look, Kylie Collins and Charlotte Shavatban have not looked like the potential elite number two and number three that we thought they might be. And then you look at Avrutsky and Zainalova, maybe not playing as well as last year's freshmen. Mm -hmm. And you need both of those to, to be the case. If you want to win another national title and you probably expected one of those to click this early in the season. So the reality is, it doesn't look like both has happened. 
Would I bet on that staying the same? Absolutely not, right? So I think we're going to see this team continue to develop at a, at a pretty rapid pace. Uh, both, you know, Avrutsky just arrived in January, and you give that team a f- another few months. You give Collins and Shavathbon another few months to find that form that they need to find. You know, definitely not a panic button here, but, you know, this is a team that's human. Yeah, perfectly put. Um, all right, USC. They ultimately scrap out a win. Uh, they get a 4-3 over Wisconsin on yep. day two of the event. Day three for them, they fall 4-1 to AM. and m Cayetano didn't play her best tennis this week. I, You know, again, I just think up and down the lineup, they didn't play their best tennis this weekend. Also, no Sloan Mora for them, unfortunately, as she was out. I don't know. I still wouldn't hit the panic button. I just don't think they played particularly well. Yeah, panic button might be strong, and we'll talk about them a little bit more at the end uh, with some of their upcoming matches. I think will tell us a lot. But ultimately, it, what's a what's a less strong word for panic? Concern. Con- I'm hitting the concern sure. button for USC. Um, the path to find four victories feels very narrow, and the the drop off between their top three singles and their bottom three is is pretty precipitous. I don't know. I kind of like Piper. I kind of like Wilson. I think they, I, we're indoors too. Like, I do think that's important to mention that USC obviously not going to be playing most of their tennis indoors. I do just think they didn't play particularly well. But again, I agree. Not a panic button. Slightly concerned. A slightly concerned button. Um, certainly not. So you're, a you're tapping the concern button. I might be just pushing it. A tentative. A, okay. It's a tentative tap. It's okay. a tentative tap. Florida. One and two on the weekend. They ultimately get the win uh, on day three of this event, 4-0 over Washington. They stole doubles points in their first two matches against Virginia, against Ohio State, and that's certainly something to build off of. I also couldn't tell you that no team looked more like a fish out of water indoors than the Florida (laughs) Gators, and I say that lovingly. I look at the game styles. I think Marley Zane played pretty well this weekend. I think McCartney Kessler did not play her best this weekend and still competed extraordinarily well. I actually feel a lot better about this Gators team having seen them play. And it's just like, these are sort of the lumps that a young team usually takes, right? Like Oklahoma is the exception, not the rule. Like I think Florida one and two, you're fine with the weekend. Yeah, this team isn't that young though. Right, yeah, with McCartney true. Kessler, Marley Zine, Carly Briggs. But they're um, young to this scene because this group hasn't had that sort of success in a while. That's true. and then, But they also have indoor courts, right, true. unlike some of these other California schools. Um, I mean, it's, there's definitely no panic button because the panic happened a few years back, <laughs> right? This is great news for them. They're actually at indoors. They did get a win. Uh, and look, this is a season of making inroads back towards – being a top 16 school, being a top 10 school. And this we can prove that they're still in that, in that level. So uh, no concern. No, I do. I just think this was a learn from your mistake sort of weekend for Florida, where it's just like, Hey, this is where we need to get better. We need yep. to be a little bit more aggressive in the biggest moments in singles, but physically we are right there with all of these good teams. And so I do, again, I would say absolutely not like, don't let the one and two record deceive you. There's the only reason they're in this again, because you might see that one and two record and say, maybe not a good weekend. I thought it was fine given the context of the losses. With that said, last point tournament awards. And we're going to go through this quickly. Um, again, all tournament team will come out. That's not something we get the chance to choose. So we get to choose our own all tournament team and go through our most outstanding player, our coach of the event as well. We agreed. Number one singles, Jay probably has to go to Peyton Stearns. I made my case for Emma Navarro. She goes two Oh and one Peyton Stearns three and Oh numbers never lie. Right? Yeah. Numbers. Well, sometimes they can be deceiving, but not <laughs> lie. Um, yeah, three and zero. Oh, she got a win over Cayetano, which is huge for her and her ranking. She went over Sleeth too, down three five in that second set, and just yep. hadn't held serve and flips it seven five. Like that was a nice win and a needed win for Texas. Yeah, and that's the sort of win you would expect for mm-hmm. someone of her caliber to put the put the victory on the board. These are huge wins for her ranking. Three and zero. Oh. Um, this isn't saying she was the the best player of the weekend. Uh, but certainly at the number one position, you know, um, best record and best wins. Yeah. And again, it's nitpicking. I do just watching Navarro. You're just like, oh, yep, she's the best player right now in women's college tennis. Um, all right. Number two single spot. This was tough. 
because obviously Elizabeth Scotty three and one overall on the weekend, the one loss coming to NC state in a match her team ultimately wins Lisa czar three and O oh on the weekend. Good win over startup save uh, our assassin sky, excuse me. Good wins in all of her matches was down a set uh, in the quarterfinals before bageling Ivanov in the third. And then, you know, obviously really impressive straight set win over Corley in the semifinals as well. Scotty or czar, what's your pick? I went Scotty, you know, the, yeah. the, you know, three and one uh, and the way in which she did it was so impressive um, for her to bounce back in that final as well and give her team that victory. Um, overall, she was probably the one that just took us all by surprise out of the gate and look, first impressions last. And so um, for Scotty, you got to give her the nod. I would go Scotty because the totality of her four matches lasted longer than Zara's match against Ivanov. Like it was that's, but no, I would just say more broadly, Scotty, the point she, to put the point on the board, the way she did against Virginia so decisively and yeah. against, uh, against, Oklahoma in the final as well. So decisively, just the impact of that and the emotion she brought as well. I think she's the pick also, but if you go czar, I have no qualms with you. I think that one is less controversial. I like, I think that's more 50, 50 than I would actually lean Navarro over Stearns at one, but it doesn't really matter. Um, three singles. There's no pick here. It's Ivana Corley four and on the weekend was the boost was the spirit, the beating heart of that Oklahoma run to the final. She's the pick. Absolutely. Yeah, no, nothing I, more to add. Yeah, exactly. And we'll get to more of her later. Uh, number four singles. I mean, Crawley and Miller were even. So like, again, you can put a dash between them if you want. I go Crawley simply because straight sets in the final, that win, the boost to go up to one and take the two straight set wins after dropping four first sets. It meant everything to Carolina. Yeah, agreed. And this is where you start to lean to the team that had the success, right? And Crawley was a part of that, played the extra match. Um, but these two players were literally neck and neck uh, when the match was called. Crawley had a swinging forehand. She missed wide on match point that she makes seven out of 10 times. But yeah, she's a pick at four. And this is where we see, by the way, the champs flex their muscles. Yep. Carson Tangelic undefeated at five singles unequivocal pick there right and then i think number six as well unc annika yarlagata clinches the semifinals clinches the finals was up six one five two in the one match she didn't finish three oh and one on the weekend the bottom three for carolina what are the difference in the and what you know ultimately won them this title yeah it was right i mean this is the the strength of the lineup that really demonstrated it was two five four five and six right where they got so many of their victories and look, we talk about this all the time, right? Depth wins championships and look at the team, look at the all tournament team that tells you all you need to know. Absolutely. So with that in mind, let's get to the doubles Four and oh, Corley sisters set the tone, you know, again, win, beat everyone, beat Texas, yeah. beat Pepperdine, beat UNC. They might be the number one doubles team in the country come the next poll. Yeah. I mean, there's the, the quality of teams that they beat and just the energy that they brought yes. to carry that into the other teams who might be less experienced in college tennis, carry that into singles. I mean, four, no numbers don't lie, but the energy um, gives them the boost. Yeah. And they pull trigger down the line a lot, but there's an aggression they play with and just the crossing and just everything. I, you love the spirit of the Cordley's absolutely yep. what you want in your number one doubles team. Number two, and it feels good to get some NC State representation on here because they were that good in doubles and Jada Daniel and uh, she plays with Nell Miller. Nell Miller. Me. Yeah, Daniel Miller, the win they had over North Carolina, the comeback win over Georgia as well. I think they're the pick here. I mean, the righty forehand poach is enough <laughs> to seal the deal. But yeah, um, I mean, they single-handedly won that Georgia match, right? And they don't get that doubles point. Um, so Credit to to Daniel and Miller. Good to have NC State representation, like you said. Mm -hmm. Really impressed with the aggressiveness that they played yeah. all weekend. No, I agree with you. Now, three doubles is tough. And the actual ITA All-Tournament team has a rule. Your team has to make the quarterfinals or later to qualify. Markham and Johnson went undefeated for Wisconsin at the number three double spot. And to beat Oklahoma and to beat USC and to beat ODU what that meant to Wisconsin, I mean, they took doubles points in two out of their three matches. If you're Coach McKenna, you have something to build off of coming out of this weekend. They're the pick here, but let's pretend we follow rules. Who's the alternative pick? Well, this was, I mean, this was tough, right? Yeah. Um, 
uh, <laughs> I don't remember who we went. I think with. we said Sanford Tran, right? Did Even though we? they were down, it was just like, yeah, but they won the other three matches okay. and they were that good. And like, there's no guarantee they were going to lose. I think they were up in the return game or whatever. Yeah. Cause they went, they DNF'd in the final. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, following rules, Sanford and Tran, uh, from, from a quality standpoint, I think you got, you go with Wisconsin, but you know, yeah, no numbers and, don't yeah. lie and neither do rules. Yeah. But crack rackets, we break rules. So <laughs> they're out Markham Johnson in nice to get some Wisconsin representation on our all tournament team. Super producer, Daniel Westoff. If you do make a graphic, go with Wisconsin in that ter- all tournament team for us to tweet out on social later, because oh, we got to get a graphic. Come on. That's a, well, <laughs> all right, fine. But then you have to buy, you got to send Westoff like 17 Red Bulls because we might kill him <laughs> with all the graphics he's made uh, over the past few weeks. We can just uh, tweet it out normally. Normally then. Yeah. But we got to tweet it out. Yeah. You know what? Fair. Again, we'll do what we got to do. Um, all right. With all of that said, two things left to do here. Let's start with the Crack Rackets rankings, because certainly there's been a lot of movement over the past weekend. We got our data gathering information event. We got to see the top 16 of the top teams in the country compete. We have that Michigan over Cal result in the back of our minds as well. With that in mind, though, let's unveil our Crack Rackets top 10 rankings coming out of the national indoor event. Uh, of course, I think North Carolina has to be number one. They're undefeated. They win the national indoor event. They technically, what, were all of their matches four, no, 4-2 four, against Oklahoma, but technically didn't play a 4-3 match. I don't think you're going to get any argument there. Oklahoma's only loss was to number one North Carolina in a match where they take doubles in four first sets. That You play that match 10 times. They're absolutely winning it in a couple of scenarios. They're number two. NC State number three, because again, they're only lost to North Carolina as well. We ultimately had a tie for four between Pepperdine, Texas, and Virginia. Now, just so you all know, it's Jay and I who vote on this and we add ours up together. I had Pepperdine four. You had Texas four. We both had Virginia five. And then I had Texas six. You had Pepperdine six. We split the difference. And ultimately that kind of feels right. Like I feel like this group is a pretty good big mishmash. And honestly, I may have Virginia slightly lower. Like if on retrospect, maybe I should have put Texas five, Virginia six, but like this feels like a pretty good grouping. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I'm looking at this list for the first time and I don't remember actually the order I had them in. I'm just looking at this going, yeah, like that grouping feels right. Um, You know, particularly we got, we did get some sample right with Texas getting the win over Cal Pepperdine also beating Cal. So I think that's why I leaned Texas uh, over Pepperdine. I thought they looked better in that win against Cal. Uh, Virginia is actually same with NC state. They've only lost Mm -hmm. to UNC, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, hard to really um, knock them and, they took the doubles point against UNC. You figure you play that out there. That's going to be a four, two, four, three type of match. So all of these teams I'd say are in that. If we have like a, a tier a and a tier B, like that's where, where it lands. Yeah, I would agree with you there. And so, you know, you see again, after Virginia, uh, you've got Cal who, you know, penalized slightly by the loss to Michigan one and two on the weekend, but their two losses are to teams above them in Texas and Pepperdine. Georgia one and two on the weekend, but losses to teams above them in NC state and Virginia. I still think I, I, w- I want to point out, I feel better about Georgia now, like so yeah. much better about Georgia now than I did about Georgia coming into the event. Just the freshmen are that good being Manova Riasco, you get Kowalski at six and you know, Kopic hurdle, whatever that order is, they're still not sure, but they've just got all the pieces. And then Liam Ma was just so good against Jada Daniel. Like Georgia is that good. They're young. Give them some time to get callous. They've now played a grand total of four, five matches this season. Five. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah, see five. when they get Two you know, coming in. Yeah, I know. Maybe wait till they hit double digits, but they deserve to be in this top 10. A&M's really good. Like that's just one of my takeaways was A&M is really good, Jay. Yeah, I mean, they have the pieces, right? I mean, uh, Branson is starting to play well at the top of the lineup. She got the win over Cayetano. Cayetano, to have Makarova at two, that's a really good position for her. They were incredible in doubles. I mean, they hardly lost games in a lot of the matches that they played. Um, I was really impressed with their doubles, put them up one zero. they've got the pieces. Yeah, absolutely. And again, they're right there. Duke, uh, Ohio state tied at 10th. That's because Ohio state goes two and one on the weekend. Yes. They lost four, three to Duke, which is why Jay has a smile on his face right now, as I'm saying this, but 
your losses are 4-3 at Duke, 4-3 at uh, NC State, and 4-1 to North Carolina. Like, I, I just, I'm not going to penalize you. I do think, again, you play that match at Ohio State. I think they could have beaten Duke 4-3. And so I have them slightly above, but I can see why the Blue Devils right in the mix is obviously they lose uh, only to Oklahoma. One thing we forgot to do, by the way, with the all-tournament team, our most outstanding player of the national indoors as we wrap things up here. We agree. It's a coach. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. We got two bonus things we got to get to here. Three bonus things is I want to give you some week ahead matches as well. Most outstanding player of the event. Traditionally, I mean, I still would go with Sarah Davitella just because a tradition's a tradition, but most important, uh, most outstanding player of the event, it's eight no Ivana Corley. Like she epitomizes what was the biggest takeaway from this event, which is that Oklahoma's here to stay. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Just the dominance she brought with her sister in doubles, carry that over to singles, the beating heart of that team, whether it was talking to court one, talking to whoever she could reach. Um, you know, it felt like she brought this team a long way, not just on the court, but off the court as well. So anytime you go eight, no, that's an incredible achievement. And it's so good to see kind of, you know, someone who invested in this program, bought into Coach Cohen, and to have this level of success a few years into her tenure, uh, it's really special to see, and you hope to see other programs start to replicate this. No, Coach Cohen to put it so well in her post-match press conference, press conference interview with us, um, where she said she took a gamble. She took a bet on this exactly. Oklahoma team, yeah. and that bet paid off. And, you know, we talk about the coach of the event. All due respect to Coach Calvis, all due respect to NC State head coach Simon Earnshaw, who what a job he is doing right now in turning NC State from a new blood into a blue blood. But it's got to be Oklahoma women's tennis head coach Audra Cohen, who there's just an electricity to. There's a buy, just the intensity and just the passion for the sport. Obviously, that's something, a sentiment we try to echo here at Cracked Rackets. I'm just all in. And it's not just Coach Cohen. It's the entire Oklahoma yep. coaching staff. Just, again, their willingness to engage and participate in what is the atmosphere in college tennis and try to make it about more than just the individual tennis match that's being played on your court, but trying to build this buy-in between the team. And, you know, I joked about this with you, and I'll say this joke publicly. If I hear that, you know, again, anyone who listened to Coach Cohen in the post uh, match tournament trophy ceremony and just her speech to her team saying, Hey, we have arrived. And obviously Carolina is the team we hold this, uh, you know, we say as the standard and we want to push ourselves towards and push past ultimately. And now we know what it takes. Like, man, if I'm coach Calvis, I'm like, please don't go on the transfer portal. Like <laughs> I really like, I get if you'd want to go play for coach Cohen because I would want to go play for coach Cohen. There's just a passion, a fire. It's all headed in the right direction. There's a complete program buy-in from coach to coach, player to player. Like, yeah, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid right now. I was just bathed in it for the course of four weekends in a freezing Nielsen tennis. And I would point out, and this is not a criticism, I, it was just so nice to be back in the Midwest. I was like, this is indoor tennis. This is how a <laughs> national indoor final should feel. I, that was a big rant. I apologize. Your takeaway, Jay. Well, I had some lovely 80 degree weather while I was watching that <laughs> uh, indoor final, um, but I'm glad you enjoyed the zero degrees. But yeah, Coach Cohen, just what an incredible effort uh, that she's done. What been there six years to make the national indoor final in that time. Uh, that's that is an incredible feat. And, you know, she'd be the first one to tell you, you could vocally hear the other coaching staff, the trainers. You could hear everyone else there as well uh, if you didn't hear Coach Cohen. So I'm just really impressed with what she's been able to build there. You know, this is a, a program writ large, Oklahoma, that is invested in athletics, has been invested in tennis, and she's been able to, to capitalize on to capitalize on it. And yeah, just a hats off to her. Incredible job. Yeah, I was really hoping. And because, again, there's just a passion and intensity to Coach Cohen and Coach McKenna, all these coaches, but I was hoping Coach McKenna and Coach Cohen were going to bring out the rackets in that first match. I swear <laughs> to God, they were like two minutes away from just being like, let's play a set. Like, let's just do this thing. It's our turn to get on the court. Um, I loved it. I loved every second of it. It's always a pleasure to get to see these matches in person. Uh, of course, with all that said, a couple of things before we go. A, 
Huge shout out to our friends at Swing Vision again, who make all the things we do here at Crack Rackets possible. If you haven't already, go check out their app. It's the latest and greatest artificial intelligence for your tennis. You put up, you get the app, you set up your camera before you hit. You're going to be able to document everything you do, all the forehands, down the line, cross court, all the volleys, all the overheads, all the misses, all the makes, you name it. You, they'll be able to show it to you. Of course, you use our promo code Crack20, you'll get a $20 discount plus a four. 14 day pro trial. Again, a thank you to our friends at Swing Vision for their continued support. With that said, Jay, week ahead. I, of course, will be focused on the men's this time as I'm headed out to Seattle for the National Indoor Championships. Excited to watch all that unfold. We'll talk about it later on this week here at Cracked Rackets. But what do we have in store for us when it comes to the women's action? Obviously, things don't slow down now. No, they definitely don't. They really start to heat up. Um, and I'll, I'll keep you covered on the women's side. Don't worry. But there's three to keep your eye on this weekend. Uh, speaking of Coach Cohen, I think she and Coach Young signed some deal together. They've just had all the teams kind of cycle through, the, <laughs> do the Oklahoma swing. Uh, the next team up is actually USC. So we talked about kind of the struggles they had at indoors. They now go on the road against both Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. Those should be really good test. We get to see Oklahoma back in action uh, pretty quickly after their run to the indoor final. I'm curious to see how USC bounces back. And clearly Oklahoma State was on the outside looking in this past weekend. So they'll be hungry to get uh, to get a shot at, at USC. So definitely looking forward to the Oklahoma swing. So with that in mind, USC 0-2, 1-1, and 2-0. and 0-2. Wow, that's spicy. There's your take for you, Scotty B. Ryan Lee also asked, what do you think of the Texas lineup switch from four to six, Shabbat upon down to number four? That makes sense? It's a good question because the next matchup we're talking about and the last one to, on the week ahead is NC State versus Texas. Okay. How about that barn burner for this weekend? Um, so excited to see that matchup played look i think if shavatapan can get wins at four she needs to be in a place where she's getting wins and so if that means building her confidence back up at four before moving back up to three then it is what it is so uh, she just needs some wins so i'm really excited to see nc state versus texas i think nc state's going to take the doubles i think texas could be pretty strong at the top of the lineup there but we talked about nc state's depth and if texas is still having you know uh, questions at the bottom of the lineup, then I think NC State uh, cleans up there. Yeah, no, I, I think that's going to be a fun one to watch. I would throw one more thing at you. Shout out to Princeton, 4-0 over Cornell, 4-0 over Columbia, 4-0 over Harvard after the most brutal 0-6 start to the season. They are now 3-6. and They are at Michigan this Sunday, um, I believe. Is it this Sunday? It's got to be this Sunday, right? I think that's a week. Yeah, this Sunday I mean, now they have confidence, like at least finally they have built up that. And I do think that's a fun one to watch as well. Not just because it's my Wolverines, because it's like, all right, can Princeton get over, you know, now they've won a match. Can they win a big match? And so that would be one other one I would have to watch. But of course, again, it's gonna be a really fun weekend of action, not just on the women's side, on the men's side as well. We will be covering the division one men's national indoor championships from first ball to last in Seattle, starting Friday, 12 p.m. Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific. As always, we'll cover it Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, myself, Mark Bay, super producer, Daniel Westoff. We'll be back later in the week to preview all that action as well. Back Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern time for our men's edition of the deciding point with all that said, Jay, any final thoughts before we wrap today's show? I hope you and Westoff get a good few nights sleep before Seattle. I'm still recovering, so I can't imagine how you two are doing. Excited for the live show on Thursday. Um, excited to see how my, oh, I made, I got three of the four semifinalists, right? So let's see how I do on the men's side. Um, I'm excited to see how that plays out, but overall best of luck. 7 15 AM. Uh, that's my flight to Seattle tomorrow. So shout out to super producer Danny Westoff for driving me. I don't think my eyes are going to be open till like, I don't know, March, March 6th, <laughs> I would guess. Um, but yeah, that's again, 
A, beats a real job. B, nothing better than this sort of action. So with all of that said, a huge shout out again and thank you to everyone at the ITA, everyone in Madison, Wisconsin, the entire staff at the Nielsen Tennis Stadium. They were so kind, so accommodating to myself, Mike Cation, our Crack Rackets team. And obviously we're immensely grateful for the opportunity to cover the event. A shout out to all the players, the coaches. They deal with a lot of my nonsense uh, from time to time and uh, again, are far too kind uh, in the their responses, their embracing of what we're trying to do here at Crack Rackets. And then again, shout out to all of you who tuned in, not only to our broadcast this past weekend, but to today's show. Uh, of course, we'll be back next week to talk about all the action once again. And we'll be here every week throughout the 2022 college tennis season. With all of that said, for my fantastic co-host, John J. Parsons, our super producer, Daniel Westoff, our friends at Swing Vision, and for all of us here at both Crack Rackets and the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, I am your host, Alex Gruskin. Jay, what do we tell our people? Hey, great shot. And we will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.